Hello, I am Crafty Patty, and thank you for coming back to watch part three. If you did miss parts one and two, don't worry. I have the links for those down in the description box below this video. Part one was on how you do a crazy quilt. And part two was how you do the beautiful herringbone embroidery stitch around all your pieces. And then we made it into a pillow. So now, part three, we're going to put our quilt squares together. Originally, I only had six, at least I thought I had six, and I found three more in a Christmas bin. Okay, I, I don't know, they were there, but I'm glad I found them and now we can make a larger quilt. I had bought some batting that would fit just these. It is a bit bigger, it's 40 inches in fact. So what we're gonna have to do now is just recalculate. So my sashings and my uh, binding will all fit and this will all work. So we'll just have to cut down these squares and it will work out just lovely. Before we get started on putting our quilt all together, there is a beautiful story that goes along with this. So do listen to the story. If you don't want the story, well, feel free to fast forward and you can get right on with the quilting process. But it's a little touching, so I think you'll enjoy it. I originally started doing this crazy quilt for my daughter, who is now in her 30s. When her Oma started seeing me so these crazy quilt squares, she wanted to get involved and so she started to do all the herringbone embroidery around all these squares and she signed it with her name, Oma 1991. And I've embroidered this square, just saying grandma, that I've worked on it from 1991 to 2022. I know I didn't quite get it finished in 22. That's okay, close enough. And I'm now, going to give it to my granddaughter, my daughter's daughter. And I've also put my granddaughter's name on here, which is Hannah, and she was born in 2020. And the extra special thing about this is that my daughter named her daughter after her Oma, and her name is Hannah as well. So Hannah, her Oma, who worked on this in 1991, is now going to be Hannah's quilt for 2020. Isn't that amazing? So now she will have it, and I've got her name on this as well. So it's really quite a heirloom quilt that's gone through many generations. So I think that is really special, and I'm sure she will cherish this for a very long time. That's the story. So let's get this finished together. When I'm working on big projects, I like to bring out my two folding tables. It's nice because then you can put them away later. And when you've got the two together, it dips down. And I don't want my fabric to dip down in here. So then I just take some masking tape and I just go over that um, join in the middle here. And it just prevents the fabric from dipping down into that hole. Next step. I'm using white flannel for my backing and I have pre-washed and ironed this enough that it's got most of the wrinkles out of it. And I'm just going to smooth it out as much as I can and then I'm going to tape it to the table so it stays secure. Once I've got it nicely spread out, I'm going to tape one edge and then I'll tape the other edge. Tape down on the bottom here. And then just keep coming up, smoothing it out and taping. Once you've got your backing placed down, then you're ready for your batting. I usually like to use a product called Warm and Natural. It's a cotton product, but I don't have enough of this. I do have a polyester batting on hand, so I will be using that 
today. And we'll just place this on top of our backing. And again, we'll smooth that out so it's nice and flat. Measuring my batting here, I don't have a true 40 inches. It's more like 39 and three quarters. So just to be on the safe side, I'm going to come down to 39 inches that my final width can be. It can't be any wider than that. So let's calculate how big to make our squares to allow for our sashings in the middle. Right now, my blocks are measuring approximately 14 inches. And don't worry, I'm going to write the centimeters up on the screen for you if you need the centimeters. So we need to cut this down to 13 inches. And this is how I've worked it out. I'm not going to do sashing on the outside border. I'm going to just do a binding, but I'm going to put sashing in the middle of the block. So I only need two sashings in the middle here. So here's a little diagram for you. We have three blocks going across and we have sashing in the middle. I'm going to allow for one half inch seam allowances all the way th through the project just to make it easy. So let's say if we cut our blocks at 13 inch square and we have half an inch seam allowance, our finished block will end up at 12 inches. For our sashings, if we cut them at two and a half inches, half an inch seam allowance, our finished will be one and a half inches. So if we add up all our measurements down here, our final measurement will be 39 inches. Now, of course, you can make your blocks any size you want. What I was doing here was maximizing the length of my quilt top to fit the batting that I had, which was 39 inches. But by all means, you can make them any size you want. I have an OmniGrid quilting square. This will really help to make our perfect 13 inch square. These actual rulers here are actually more than 12 inches. They're 12 and a half. But that's okay. I'm just going to place this on here, and that will give me two really nice squared up edges. And now I'll just come through with my rotary cutter and cut off this one edge here. And just have to kind of go all the way through, even though your ruler's not there, you can just do an estimate there. And then come through and cut off this edge here. And again, just do a little bit of an estimate on that last bit. Now that I've got two really clean edges, I'm going to move it into my guide so I can see my guide underneath here. So I've got a clean guide on my cutting mat up and down here, making sure it's perfect. Now that I've got a good cut with my square ruler, I'm going to come in with my longer ruler so I can get all the way through to follow my guidelines. And this is my 13 inch mark here and there's my 13 inch mark up here. And then we can cut this off. And I'll find my 13 inches coming up this way, matching up my ruler to my line on my cutting mat. And then I can cut across for my last cut. And now we have a true 13 inch square. And I'll do the same to all my other squares. I prefer to cut in the middle of my cutting mat, not on the edge. And it's a little harder to count over with my numbers. So I've just put some masking tape. I know I'm coming down to this corner here. Here's my line here I'm cutting to, and I know I'm cutting to this line here, so then I don't have to keep counting to make sure I've got 13 every time. And remember that we allowed for sashings to be two and a half inches. We've only got nine blocks, so we need two, four, six sashings at two and a half inches by 13 inches. So we'll cut those. I've got two that I can cut at once here, one on top of each other. 
So that goes a little bit faster. I've left my guides here for my 13 inches, so I can use those. And here's my 13 inch guide. So there's two, and I'll cut four more. Now is the time to place your squares out in the order that you want. I decided to have the embroidery of Oma, Grandma, and Hannah in the middle here, going from left to right. And I've made it sure that all the little girls in the center are facing upright. I did catch a little error, but it's not too late, because what we wanted to do was, was put our blocks in the right order so we knew how they're going to sit, which is great. But now, what I've realized is that I allowed for a half inch seam allowance on this side and a half inch on this side. But I'm not taking a half off on this side because I'm not adding a sashing over here. This is going to just be a straight edge and the binding is going to go right over that. So I'm going to be a half inch too long on this side and a half inch too long on this side. So that's going to make it too big for my 39 inch batting, but that's okay. Once I've got my sashing sewed on, I'm going to go back and I'm going to take a half inch off this side and a half inch on that side. And the same with the other blocks here and here, just on the edge. And then we'll be back in business. If you have a piece of batting that's a lot larger than mine, then don't worry about it because it'll all work out. You won't have to make any adjustments. Let's put those binding strips on now. So basically right sides together, matching up your raw edges and your ends. And when I'm quilting, I do like to use the magic clips because it doesn't uh, distort where my fabric is when I'm putting pins in. Sometimes the pins will push it around a lot. So I'm going to use the magic clips. I have a one half inch guide on my sewing machine, so I can either follow that, or if you find it easier, a sewing knitting gauge works wonderfully as well to hold it on the edge and follow where your arrow is. So we'll just sew that down, half inch seam allowance. And the more accurate you are with your seam allowance, the better it all pieces together so everything matches up. Ironing is your best friend again for quilting. I've got this on the right side and I'm just pushing my fabric out. And as you see, we are ironing everything towards the sashing. Here's our next square, right sides together and matching up your raw edges and your ends and pinning in place. And again, to the machine for one half inch seam allowance. We've sewed down, we're going to open this up, and again, we're going to press toward our sashing. And you'll see that it's all going into the sashing for ironing. Same as before. Right sides to right sides, matching it up, and one half inch seam allowance again. And this one has been sewed in place. We've ironed it. And again, our last square, right sides together, and again, pin in place, and stitch down half an inch seam allowance. And I always sew with the bulk of the quilt to the left and the raw edge to my right. And do the same for your next row and your next row, adding your sashings in between your squares. Now you're ready to add your sashings to put all these together. The easiest way is to cut a sashing the same width as this, this is two and a half inches, and cut it the length of, sorry, and cut it the width of your quilt. And then you just bring it right sides together you sew along and you do the same thing with your other ones. Then you bring your right sides together, sew those together, and your last one. That's option number one. Or you can cut little cornerstones just to give it that little bit more of a pop in your quilt. These are cut the same width 
as your sashing. So two and a half by two and a half. Here's your two and a half inch sashing. I've cut it two and a half by two and a half, little cornerstone, right sides together. And you're doing your half inch seam allowance as always. There's the first one that will get ironed. Add on your next piece of sashing, right sides together. Open that up, right sides together. Put it up. And I will iron this later on the ironing board properly. And again, right sides together and you've finished your little cornerstones. And the last one. And here's our cornerstones that we need to match up to this. So we're going to start by going right sides together. And then you're going to look underneath and you're going to make sure that that is matched up perfectly. Because that's going to make all the difference in the world when you sew this quilt together so it looks pretty. So once you've got that lined up, mark that one in place. Just going to do two here just to make sure. And again on this one, and you can see that I just need to bring that over just a bit. Just making sure that that is definitely lined up. This is more important than your side, so you've got to pin this first. Once you've got that in place, then you can come back in and pin in the middle and on your sides. And then you'll be ready to sew that together. Move back to the machine. Again, half inch seam allowance. And again, making sure that you're ironing. Same as before, where all your seams are toward your sashing. There's our beautiful little cornerstone matched up perfectly because we took the time to pin that first in place. And the other reason I wanted to add these little cornerstones because they were roses and my granddaughter's middle name is Rose. So <laughs> I just had to put those in there, didn't I? And just like before, right sides to right sides. This one's coming over. Again, take extra special care that these are matched up perfectly. And always as before, keep the bulk of your quilt to the left and your raw edges to the right and away we go. And here's our finished nine square with our cornerstones. As I mentioned earlier in the video, talking about how my quilt top will be too big for my batting. So I'm going to go ahead and take half an inch off the left side, just the sides, not the top and bottom, just the left side and the right side. To take my half inch off, I've placed my raw edge of my quilt along a guideline of my cutting mat here. And then I've placed my OmniGrid ruler so it's parallel with my line on my cutting mat as well. I'm now matching up where my half inch mark is right here. And as long as this is sitting parallel exactly on that line, I can be reassured that I'm going to cut straight through half an inch all the way down. and I'm only able to get up as far as my ruler would go. So I'm just going to move my quilt down. Again, lining it up on my cutting line. Now that I've got more room, I can bring my ruler up, matching up to my half inch line at the top here and matching up where I've already cut and then I can continue my cut. And I will do the same for the other side.
Now that we have our sandwich ready to go, we have our backing, our batting, and our quilt top. We've cut it down so it will fit the batting. Now our next step is to decide how we want to quilt these three layers together. One idea is that you can stitch in the ditch. That means you're stitching right in that seam line and you could do the whole square and continue that on the other ones. You could do that. You could do freehand quilting. So you're just doing little squiggles here and there. If you want to do that, that's another idea. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some abstract, just straight lines. And I think that will accent the crazy quilt. And this is what I mean by doing straight lines. There's two ways to get really nice straight lines. You can grab some masking tape and then just pull it out and then decide where your first line is going to be and then tape it right on like that and then you're going to sew along that line. Now when you put on the masking tape it tends to distort it slightly as you can see it bows out a little bit you can see even though i thought i was putting it on straight you can see where it's not really straight at all it's really okay it doesn't have to be dead straight it's all abstract right and then you would come along and you would just follow that line and sew on your sewing machine you just keep going along and putting another one and put it off on another angle it doesn't matter how you do it it's abstract the other way is to come in with uh, the longest ruler you've got. I've got a metal ruler here. And just so I can show you, I'm going to make a line right down in here so it's in camera. And then you can use a soapstone marking pencil. It just looks like this. It's, it's really, really hard, but it makes a nice little white line. So the advantage of the white lines is that you don't have the tape in the way when you're trying to sew many different angles. Or you can use a fabric marker and these are washable. You just put a little tiny bit of water on your fabric and it comes right out. Or there's actually air erasable and uh, this will come out just within a matter of hours and you will be gone, even less than that, probably within the hour. And depending on the color of your fabric, will depend on whether this option works good for you. If you've got darker fabrics, then the soapstone might work better for you. If you've got multicolored fabrics like I have, then this might be a better option. You can really see that line quite well, and that's an easy line to follow when you're sewing. This was my first line here, and then I'm just going to go any which way and just make another line. Sometimes you might want to look at your fabrics to see if there is something that you don't want to copy the same line. It doesn't really matter with this technique. My ruler won't go all the way. I'll start my line and then I'll just move it down and finish my line. So I'm going to do my next one right here. And like I said, don't worry about this, the messy lines on your quilt because it will wash off. All right, so you're just going to keep going any which way filling up your quilt in all different angles with lines. Once you've drawn on a lot of lines, you might find that you can't really see where you're at. So when I come in and I do my quilted lines, and then if I don't have enough, I can always come in and do some more. Once you've got lots of lines drawn on, then I would come in and I would hold them in place, your three layers, with curved safety pins and they've just got a little bit of a bend in here so it's just easier to get it into your three layers and easier to fasten it so i'm going to go around and attach these where there is not a line in between the lines and here's a spot right here i can get into so just going straight down piercing all those fabrics and try not to get too much of the safety pin in there just a little bit because then it's hard to get it out again and then once you've got it coming out i just use my finger to close it up you want to put in quite a few just so your fabric doesn't move around 
And I'll continue to put in some more pins, trying to pin about every four to six inches. Once you've got all your pins in, you can take off all your masking tape that was holding down your backing. And if you've got any excess backing and batting, then feel free to cut some of them off. You don't need all that. Taking that to the sewing machine. And then I would just turn this to the back side and just make sure you didn't create any puckers when you were doing your pinning. And I think we are good. A lot of quilters will prefer to use 100% cotton thread. This is polyester thread, but that's what I like. An all-purpose thread is just fine. Uh, one advantage is a cotton thread could shrink and could tend to make your um, quilt pucker a little bit. But other quilters say they like the cotton because it blends with your, your fabrics better. So it really is your choice. What sewing machine to use? I have a manual Husqvarna or Viking. It's a great little machine. Now if you do have a manual like this, I would pick up a walking foot and they look like that. A walking foot will feed from the top and the bottom and that just allows your layers of your quilt to stay together. So that's optimal for this type of machine. I recently bought a FAP Quilt Expression 720 machine. On the Quilt Expression 720 IDP machine, which means integrated dual feed, you'll see that right here is this little black attachment and it will hook into the presser foot and then it automatically sets you up for integrated dual feed, which means that the fabric from the top and the bottom will feed at the same time to prevent layers from shifting while sewing. So this is a quilting machine. So this is what we're going to quilt on today. It's best to start quilting in the middle of your quilt. So I'm going to look for a line that's going through more or less the middle. And I've got one right here. So this is the first line that we are going to quilt. I'm just going to roll up the right side here because I'm going to start on the top here for sewing. And I'm just rolling it up closer to where I'm going to sew my first line, which is right here. For stitch length for quilting, it's generally around 10 to 11 stitches per inch. I have set my cap at 2.5 for my stitch length. I'm using pink on the top because there's a majority of pink thread on the top. Backing is white, so I've got white for my bobbin. If you find it easier, you can choose to pick up some quilting gloves. This is Fawns and Porter, and they're just handy because they've got the little grips on the back side, so you can use your hands and it won't slip while you're moving your fabrics. Here we go. I'm just going to sew along my blue line that I've marked on for our first quilting line. And because you've got a fair bit of bulk down in here, you do need to keep lifting it up and making sure that it's not pulling down here with all your fabric because otherwise you'll just have really tiny stitches up in here. So you have to help it a little bit. You just need to keep adjusting and keep making sure it's not cut up on your lap at all anywhere. Bring up your one side of your quilt here so it's not hanging down and pulling and just keep adjusting. That's just what you have to do. And I am using my gloves too. You can see it's like bunching up a little bit here. So I am just smoothing that out. So if I get to a part like that, I'm just using my gloves to pull out a little bit to sew through that area there. Here's my first quilting stitch line. And now I'm going to look for another one that goes through the middle again, and I'm going to come through this way, keeping it in the middles, and then I'll work out to get my lines on the other side. That's my line there I'm going to sew through on, so we'll just roll up towards that line there. That will be to the right of my machine, sewing here, and this will hang off to the left. And let's sew down this one. 
And when you need to adjust your fabric or you need to lift it up or whatever, do make sure that your needle is down into the fabric. And it's best actually if your presser foot is down as well, like so. And then adjust and then it won't move around on you and then you're good to go. And just so you know, I did end up going up to 3.5 for my stitch length. And that's what it looks like there. If you're doing this form of uh, top quilting with the abstract lines, you might find it's hard to see where you're at. So once I've done all the lines that I have drawn on, I'm going to turn it over. And then I can see what I still need to do. So you can see where there's every spot where there's about, oh, like a little five, six inch square. That's great. It looks like I need to probably come through here, make another one through here. And another one through here. I've got a big hole in here. And there's all the quilting on the back side. And I think that is plenty. You need to get your blue marking pin off. It's only a damp cloth, one little swipe down, and out it comes. It comes out really easy. Now that you've got all your blue lines out or whatever method you've used, you can remove your pins. And now clean up your edges the best you can. I've laid my OmniGrid ruler on here, and I'm coming as close as I can to my edge down here and finding my clean edge here. You can see where this fabric here has come off a little bit. So we're just going to clean that up. And at the same time, we're going to cut through our batting and our backing. So it's all nicely cut together. And then just pull it down and continue on cleaning up those edges. Here it's a little tiny bit off there, and then I'm just trying to get up as close as I can so I've got all my fabric underneath here. It's a little bit short right there, so I'm just going to move it back just so I can catch that blue there so it's all lined up. When you're quilting, it does tend to distort it a little bit, but do the best you can just to make a nice clean edge and it will be just fine. And go around and do the same to all four sides. Once you clean up your edges, you want to measure around your whole quilt. I have about 39 inches here. I'm just going to round up to 40 inches coming down here. And then we'll measure across this way. And I have about 30 and a half. I'm just going to round up to 40 again. Your quilt will not probably be the same size as mine because this is like a little sample one for a baby. But uh, this is what I've done. We've measured one down one side, it's 40 inches, and the other side is 40. So we've got two sides, so we add that together, we times it by two, and we get our total um, measurement around our whole quilt. Now, to do your binding, you want to have an extra couple feet on the one side so when you go to join your two bindings together you want some extra fabric. So I've added two feet which is 24 inches so total 184 inches and of course our yardage uh, you'd have to divide by 36 and that brings us up to 5.1 yards and I've just done it in centimeters so those that work in centimeters this might make more sense as far as measurements and how much we're using for our binding. I've got two long binding strips. They've been cut to two and a half inches and now I need to join these together so we've got a continuous round all the way around our quilt and I'll show you how we're going to do that. Now it's hard to tell on this fabric because it looks like both sides are the right side but I've got my right side facing up here and this is my right side facing down. So then we're just going to take both our ends and we're going to put them on like so. And then all we're going to do is we're going to sew from corner to corner. And then we're going to have a continuous strip of binding. And just as a guide to remember, I'm going to put a pin up in the top here. And I've put it in the direction that I'm sewing, just so it reminds me what I'm doing. 
And now you can just uh, cut off the excess. And now you've got a continuous binding to go around your quilt. Ironing this open for that little seam you just made. And you're going to iron all this in half. And just make sure that you've got it facing the right way. So you've got your seam where you've joined it together. That is going to be on the inside. So just matching up your raw edges. And iron that whole long strip of binding. We've got our binding all ironed. Here's our fold. There's our raw edges that will go up against our raw edge of our quilt. What we've done here is we've left 12 inches or about 29 centimeters and we're not going to start sewing here. We're going to start sewing here because we want to leave this out so we can join our binding when we come around to meet it back to here again. So let's match up our binding to our raw edge here and we're just going to use the magic clips. I prefer these when I've got a lot of bulk. And then we're going to start to pin right there and that will tell us where we're going to start sewing. I'm sewing at a quarter inch seam allowance and I'm using my press foot as a guide. So I'm going to sew up to a quarter inch away on this edge here. If you have a hard time judging that then I always like to use my little gauge here. That's my quarter inch right there. And I'll stop there. I'll do a few reverse back stitches here just to secure that. Or just from your stitching area. So you can make your turn. So you're going to bring it up. And you can tell because you want this parallel with this, then you know you've made your angle correctly, just like so. And then this is going to fold back down on top of itself like that. And then just pull that nice and smooth. So then you've got that little bend in there. And once you've made your beautiful little fold, you can clip in place if you want to. And then we're going to start up at the top edge and we're going to sew down our next side. And again, my presser foot's lining up along here, so I know that's my quarter inch seam allowance. And you'll do the same for your other three corners. And stop sewing when you're about a foot away from where you started sewing. And there's your extra piece. And we'll have an extra piece on the side as well. We've attached our binding. And we've gotten this far. And here's what we've got left over. Now we're going to attach these. I want to be able to attach my binding so it's attached in the middle here. So it's easier for sewing. So I've got space on each side. So I'm going to cut it off right there. And now this side can sit nice and flat. And that piece we cut off will give us our two and a half inches. So I'm just going to place that right up there. And then when this one comes over, I know exactly where I want to cut my next piece. So I'm going to be cutting it right to there. And I'm going to give the top one just a little bit of a snug little pull so it's a really nice fit. I'm going to make sure that this is sitting exactly at the right measurement below. And then I can bring over my ruler and I'm going to draw in my cut line right here. Take that down and we'll cut through on my cut line here. And because my fabric looks like it's the same color on the right side and the wrong side, so I'm going to come in here and make an X for you. And that will help you hopefully so you know what I'm doing. And I'll do the same on this one. This is my wrong side. 
because this is going to be two piece fabric that you've got to pull together, it's much easier if you come in here and grab your quilt and just double it up a bit in the middle here. If you've got a nice big clip, that's perfect. And then just leave it like that. It's going to be much easier. Here's our right side. This is the right side. That's the wrong side where I drew the X on it. We want right side up coming towards you. Here's your left side. And if you open that up, you'll see that's my wrong side. This is my right side. So we're going to put right side to right sides. I'm going to match up my two pieces of fabric here along both raw edges. And what I did before I drew on this line that you now see, because I had to redo this for you, is I just looked underneath to see where the my corner was, and I made a little mark. So I knew that's my corner there. The top side is fine because you can see where your fabric is. And then I grabbed my ruler and matched up my mark here to my corner there and drew across with my fabric pen. And then we just need a pin on this side. And a pin on this side. And I'm going to go to the machine now and we're going to sew across. And you can take your clip out and take your pins out and then just do a test and make sure you're good. It's not twisted and that's a nice tight fit. So we're good. So now that we know we're okay, we're just going to bunch that up again and we can cut off our excess at a quarter inch and then bring that together and we're going to sew that up a quarter inch seam allowance to close that up i like to press my binding over so i don't get any bunching ironing is always your friend and that will just make it easier when you go to pull your binding to the other side and give a little iron right into that little corner too. And that will make that, again, so much easier for when you turn that to your other side so it's nice and pressed. Now that you've pressed that nicely, you can just easily fold that over and pin in place all the way around. And when you're pinning, just make sure you're bringing up your binding so it's covering your stitch line from the other side. And when you get to your corner, you can take off a little tiny bit of bulk in there, but just be really careful not to cut into anything back of that seam line. Otherwise, you're going to get a hole in your corner. Just You can just take off a little bit. I'm just going to take off a little bit more of that bulk right in here. And then... Crease it down, and then you're going to fold up right there. And then you've got a nice little corner on this side, and then you'll stitch down, and you've got your mitered corner here as well. And then you can decide how you want to stitch that in place. You can use a zigzag, you can use a straight stitch, you can use a decorative stitch. Depends on the machine that you have. I wanted to do a few little samples. I have the Faf Expression 720, and here's a few that I tried. Because I'm going to use white thread, because I want the embroidery to show, I'm gonna go for more of a simple design, and the one reason is because on the back side, it seems to be the, the best one that actually shows good on the reverse side as well, whereas these ones aren't as clear on the reverse. Not so bad, but I'm going to go with a simple one. And what I've done is I've just made it a little smaller so it will fit my binding. So I brought it down to 10 and 6, just in case you've got a fat too and you want to do the same one. And it is 5.1.13 for the design. To aid in sewing the embroidery stitch. I'm just using my stiletto from the Alex Anderson tool and I'm just holding it down to make sure that I cover over my bottom stitch line just to make sure that it's going to stay in place. 
So I'll just hold that in place, but not putting too much pressure because I want the machine to move up and down to make its design so I'm not pulling on it and not distorting the design. And I'll show you the completed uh, embroidery when I get all the way around the quilt because this is going to take a little bit of time. And here's the front embroidery on my binding. It did a pretty good job. And there's the back side. So there's a little accent on the back as well. So I'm quite happy with the way that turned out. And there's our finished quilt, 32 years in the making, but we're finished. And I do happen to have an iron on label made with love by grandma. So that's definitely got to go on. And we've got a pillow to go with it. Oh, that feels so good to have this finished. It only took 32 years. <laughs> but it's such a wonderful quilt and a heirloom quilt that's gone through three generations. So it's really special. So I'm glad I've got it finished. And we have the pillow that we made in part one and part two. If you missed those videos, don't worry. I have links in the description box below so you can do part one, the quilt, part two, the embroidery, and part three, putting the whole quilt together. Thank you so much for watching the series with me. And this completes part three. Until we meet again, bye-bye.